the effect produced in Paris by this promenade of the heralds at arms was slight. At Rams, the heralds had scattered the pieces of gold and silver only in the nave and choir of the church. There were some unsoured accidents. A well-dressed woman received a score of medals upon her neckerchief. She was instantly hustled, her hat knocked off, and her clothes nearly tore from her back. Was this an example of treating the people as sovereign? The emperor had at first wished to return for Notre Dame to the Champ de Mars. He had then decided to put off until the morrow of the consecration is a of eagles to the deputations of the army and the National Guard. On that day, the weather, though cold, was endurable, but the Empress was so tired and ailing that it was necessary to put it off until the 14th. Besides, the preparations were not finished. It was necessary to erect tents and amphitheaters in front of the military college. The tents were for the Emperor and his court, the Senate, the Council of State, the Court of Cassation, the officers and ladies of the palace, and the diplomatic corps. The covered benches for the deputations of every kind. This may have been picturesque, but in December, it was a little imprudent. On the evening of the 13th, the premier, about 10 o'clock, rain mingled with snow began to fall. This lasted all night and all the morning without a break. At 10 o'clock, however, the report of the cannon boomed forth and announced that the emperor was leaving the Tuileries. There was a pause. It was hoped that the weather would lift, but it did not. Everyone except the emperor was at his post. It was necessary to start. There was more cannon firing, and this time the procession started in the drenching rain in the front went mounted chesters and mamelukes, grenadiers, and picked constabulary. Brought up the rear. The carriages kept the same orders. On the day of the coronation, the emperor was clad in his short dress. The empress, the princesses, and the ladies were in court dress with low necks. All the dignitaries, grand officers, and officers were plumed and glitteringly resplendent. When it did not rain, it snowed. Often both fell together. They crossed the garden, the Place de la Concorde, the bridge, the Rue du Bourgogne, and the Rue de Canal. A triumphal battery saluted before the Invalide. Then they reached the École Militaire by the new boulevards, which were not yet named. Their salvo was fired by all the artillery. Napoleon Bonaparte re-entered as a sovereign the house which he had left 19 years earlier on the 28th of October, 1788, as sub-lieutenant of the artillery in order to go to Valence and take up his duties in the Regiment de la Fer. He was to receive the respects of the diplomatic corps in the central pavilion in which were situated the king's drawing room and the apartments of the governor. It had been a little dilapidated, but in two months they had made the necessary repairs and the guard mob had provided carpets and seats. The emperor and empress again put on the imperial adornments and appeared in their tent. Alas, the painted cloths covered with melted snow have let in the water everywhere. Infinite pains have been necessary to the thrones from the rain the other seats were soaked and the rain fell with redoubled violence at the moment when the emperor took his place the young man burst out of the crowd and darted forward showering liberty or death several cuirassiers fell upon him and carried him off he was a house student at the saint louis hospital named far a young man of a heated imagination said fouché the same evening it will be necessary to inflict a short imprisonment upon him and then send him back to his family this was done. It was thought best to hush the matter up. No inquiry was made to see whether, as Fowl pretended later, he was not alone in his intention, whether he had not officers, soldiers, and men of distinction for his accomplices. This incident passed off a notice. The cannon sounded, and the ceremony began. All the troops were arranged in a line facing the throne. The deputations from the army on the right and left in close columns, those from the National Guards between them in the center of the line. At the foot of the throne stood the colonels of all the regiments and the presidents of the electoral college of the 108 departments holding the eagles at the head of the first side were drummers and bandsmen at the signal given by the march governor of paris the columns moved towards the throne the emperor rose soldiers here are your colors these eagles will serve you always as a standard round which to rally they will fly whithersoever your emperor shall hold their presence necessary for the defense of his throne and of his people you swear to sacrifice your lives and ever defending and upholding them with your courage on the road to victory the colonels repeated the oath brandishing the staves and unfurling the colors the soldiers presented arms and raised their caps on the end of their bayonets this piece of enthusiasm regulated by the ceremonial lasted until the colors having given over to the corps 
then there was a march past. But the onlookers, numb the cold and wetted with the water which came through the tents, had left their positions and gone in disorder to seek for some place where they might hope to find shelter. The Empress and the princesses had retired. Only Princess Caroline remained accustomed herself, she said, to endure the privations inseparable from a throne. The army, covered with mud and soaked with the icy rain, marched past in the middle of a sea of mire before empty benches. Fontaine was in despair. The emperor had been well advised when he rejected a coronation on the Champ de Mar, which was proposed to him in the memory of the Federation. Can you imagine, said he, the appearance that the emperor and his family would present exposing their imperial garments to the effect of weather, mud, dust, showers? What an opportunity for the pleasantry of the Parisians, who love to turn everything into ridicule and who are accustomed to see Sharon at the Opera and Talma at the Théâtre Francais play the Emperor a good deal better than I could do it. This time, his common sense had saved him, but he was no better pleased with his day on account of that. After passing five hours in the rain, he re-entered the Tuileries. There was still a grand dinner to come, an immense dinner, a dinner, understand, not a supper. Monsieur Talleyrand at... Six o'clock, they met in the throne room. The Grand Marshal announced that their majesties were served. The Emperor and Empress with the Pope passed into the Diana Gallery. The guests followed. There were five tables. On the days in the middle of the gallery, under canopy was the imperial table. The Empress seated herself in the middle. The Emperor on her right. The Pope on her left. The Elector of Radisvon at right angles to them. The grand officer stood behind the emperor to his right and left of pages served. On the two sides of the imperial table were the table of the princes and princesses, the table of the members of the diplomatic corps, the table of the ministers and grand officers of the empire, and the tables of the officers and ladies of the court. During the meal, there was music afterwards in the great hall, which was to be the hall of the marshals, a concert, then a ballet, which was a strange spectacle to offer to a pope. Pope the seventh retired at the moment when the ballet began. The Empress skirted him as far as the Diana Gallery. Then he returned to his seat to watch Madame Gardel Vestry and Dupont perform a short pastoral ballet with seven female and two male dancers accompanied by the flute tambourine and triangle. He was so pleased with this that he bestowed a gratuity of 3,000 francs upon each of the dancers. <laughs>